when I write a novel, I literally don't know what I'm writing till I've finished it. So I, when I say I was in the middle of this novel, I was writing something. I didn't know quite what it was, but I'd written a lot of it. I was trying to shape it and I didn't have a title for it. I don't think I had any sort of title, actually, not even an embarrassing one. And I just literally was reading the Sunday papers in bed and the book section came up and at the top it said nonfiction. And it just, I think instantly I thought, has anyone ever called a novel nonfiction? I'm going to call my novel nonfiction. And it was so right, but I mean, it was so random the way I came across it. I wasn't, I mean, I think, I do think that when you're writing a novel, you have like these sort of antennae that are out all the time, whatever you're doing in the world, not when you're writing, when you're out there in the street, whatever you're doing, this consciousness of your novel is there. And if something suddenly comes to you that's part of your novel, you just notice it immediately. It's kind of, it's more like a trawling net, I sometimes think. You catch things in it. And when I'm writing a novel, I have this net cast very wide. So I saw this word and the word did something to me that it wouldn't normally do. Obviously, I've seen the word nonfiction in my life a lot. And and it was it was all one word. It had to be that too. It just happened to be nonfiction, not hate, no hyphens, nothing like that. And I just knew it was my title. And from that moment, I suppose it would be true to say that I was so excited by that title that it probably did help me continue with the book and shape and understand what I was doing. I suppose I would say that I was perhaps subconsciously already writing a novel called nonfiction. I just didn't quite know it. What about sense. your publisher? How did your publisher receive news of this title? <laughs> well, it actually it was my agent. I never show anyone, I never tell anyone, not even my husband, anything at all about a book I'm writing until I consider it to be finished. So yes, I delivered a book to my agent called Nonfiction. No, she loved the title. It, it is problematic though, because if you Google Nonfiction by Julie Myerson, well, at the moment, actually, I think the book does come up, but you know, generally it's not, not ideal for Google. It's not a great title in that sense. I think it confuses booksellers a little bit, but I also know, of course I do, that it's, there's a tease contained within that title. And for me, it was the right, it was the right tease. It, it's, you know, it's a book about the stories we tell ourselves and the fact that actually everything in a novel is true, whatever you're writing about in a way, it comes from a part of you that's true. And so I'm not putting it very well, actually, but it, the, the title just felt right to me. Well, you have also said of this book that it is, quote, completely made up. It is also completely true. So that <laughs> kind of true. speaks to what you just yes. said. I think that you can kind of apply that rubric to any novel. Yeah. Even a novel, I'm, yeah. even a novel that's like super fantastical or imaginative mm. still has its personal and autobiographical elements. It does. I think it's a double thing because I think um, I was partly playing against that idea, which actually annoys me slightly. And I think it's more true of women than men, that when someone reads a novel by you, you know, it probably applies to men too, people immediately want to know which bits have really happened to you, which bits are true, whether it's the sex or the bad events or whatever it is. or They, they, they want to pin that on you. And I find that frustrating. But then I have actually in the past written quite a lot of true things about my life and got into trouble for that so I also a part of me knew that people would be on the lookout for that and I think there was another strange part of me that was sort of thinking okay bring it on come and get me if you want um because actually yeah I think this is true too I found myself towards the end of this novel really as I was writing it realizing I was deliberately writing it to make it sound absolutely true I wanted to write a novel that sounded like it was true about me, Julie Myerson. It's actually not. It's hugely fictional. In fact, there's only one strand in it which is not fictional. But I wanted people to think it was all true. And I wanted them to ask me that and for me to be able to say, no, it's not true. <laughs> this is ridiculous that people always think everything you write is true. In fact, I mean, my fourth novel years ago was about a Victorian woman with an amputated leg who lost, who gave her baby up, had to give her baby up to the foundling hospital. And that character is more strongly based on me than any character I've ever written. But of course, nobody wondered about it because she was, it was Victorian times and she had one leg. So they didn't say, oh, that's you, isn't it? But actually, she is the closest to me, that character. So I, but I like that about fiction. It's like you have this, nobody knows which parts of my books are true. And there are other things in a lot of my other novels which have really happened to me and no one has ever guessed. I quite like that. I suppose it's natural for readers, especially if it's a first person narrative or if there's a protagonist that shares the same gender, or the same age range or something with you, for them to assume that you're writing about yourself. But 
that is kind of annoying that they well, don't allow. I mean, yes, is it? I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I read your novel and, and you call yourself Brad in it. And so and you and you mentioned this podcast. And so, of course, you're putting out a lot of things to say this might be about me. But I still didn't assume that every single thing you'd written in it had really happened to you or that it was true. And I think, you know, why should we? I, I love books that are partly true and partly not. And actually, as you're saying, so many, almost every novel I've written has got something of my lived experience in it. Of course it has. But I don't, you know, people don't always know which part that is. And I, I love that about books. Yeah, not, I do too. The, I do too. Also, that the pleasure of novels is not in knowing that it really happened to the author, surely. Well, not for me, it isn't. No, I'm the same. I think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, every book has its form, right? I mean, it, yeah. So, some books maybe hew closer to the quote unquote truth than others. But what I always say is that I don't have a good enough memory to write memoir like it. I, I, I have to fictionalize to make a book work. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't have I don't have the recall to just like just pull it out. Recall. Yeah. To pull it out of my brain in a way that, you know, makes sense. I can barely remember what happened yesterday. So and I'm <laughs> not a diary even... keeper. But even so, even in a memoir, and I mean, this is also what my book's about, how can we say, you know, I have actually written a couple of memoirs, but it's only my subjective truth, obviously. And, you know, other people who might have been there or thought they were there or, or, or think they know what happened, again, to say that isn't how it happened. And of course, that's true. So there is no such thing unless someone. In fact, actually, how can you possibly write a memoir that's true? You can't. The memoir is always going to be your perception of things, as is a novel. Yeah, I agree. I think these distinctions yes. get frustrating for me. I think the only way I'm writing a memoir right now, and it is based on a very detailed diary, which gives me the confidence, I think, to do it. But in oh, the that's absence, interesting. Yeah, that's in interesting. The, yeah, in the absence of that source material, I feel like I would basically just be writing autofiction if I were writing a memoir. It just but starts how to do get you blurry. know in your diary? How do you know that what you wrote down that day, you were telling the truth? You know what you weren't putting a gloss on it of some sort even to yourself or do you know that i mean no no i mean i <laughs> i like to think i like to think i wasn't but yeah i mean the question's always there and what i'm finding in writing it is that i'm still fictionalizing a little bit uh just to make the book work like connective tissue yeah. filling in little flourishes like that i didn't write down like what was the weather like that day or you know what i'm saying yeah. like you just have to sort of Sounds interesting. The, is it teenage? Are they teenage diaries? Well, it's about 2020. Uh, it's oh. about a specific time in the year 2020 amid the American election and the pandemic. Oh, I wow. was very okay. interested in that, like that, that fall, that autumn. Yeah. And oh, well, I you probably it. do know that it's true then, actually. If it's that recent, you probably have a sense of your writing down the, to the best of your ability, the truth. That's for the most interesting. Part. Yeah. For the most part. So anyway, I... Just, I guess I just really responded to that aspect of your book. There's an urgency that I feel in this book and that I will often feel in books like this, where there is a kind of blurry line between reality and fiction. And however fictionalized this is, it did feel like it really came from the heart and it's a, it did yes it did. i think for american listeners or, or people who i mean this book is being published what is it a year or so after it was published in the uk am i correct yeah yeah i think i'm um, 18 months actually i think yes uh, okay yes. so there there are mm -hmm. people i think stateside and maybe in canada and elsewhere who are new to this book and who will not understand some of the backstory that i think informs it and i think it's worth mm -hmm. at least giving people an idea of that in broad brush strokes yeah. and this is a book that its major themes are uh, among other things addiction marriage parenthood adultery mothers and daughters and writing itself have I yeah, missed right. anything <laughs> no I think it's funny because I would almost put writing first but I can see why you don't but yes yes I mean I, I easily could have You're right. you know it's yeah. just the way that I probably jotted it down yeah. but uh this is also a book, and feel free to disagree with me. I guess I'll pose mm -hmm. it as a question. It mm -hmm. feels like a book that is informed at, at, in part, in some part, by this thing that you were embroiled in back in the early aughts. Uh, there was yeah. a column, and I don't think American listeners will likely have a frame of reference, or most won't. 
but you Good. wrote a, a column, right? You and I won't make you relive it all in granular detail, yeah. but yeah, you wrote a column for the Guardian called "Living with Teenagers from 2006 to 2008." Uh, it later became a was book, it, yeah. and there was a controversy because uh, in writing about it, you were writing pseudon pseudonymously. You were writing under a pseudonym. Mm. Well, and no, actually, you, anonymously, but yes, carry Anonymously, on. sorry, yes. not pseudonym. Yes. Yeah. So nobody knew that it was you, at least at the outset. Mm -hmm. were, yeah. And then there was also uh, your son, Jake, had some issues with uh, drugs and yes. that showed up. Did that show up in a book? Yes, that showed up in a book. I mean, it's it's confusing. I can see why you're confused. I can explain yeah. it. But but yes, you're Please. right. And okay, it is... So Yes. How do I how do I explain it? the the column? You're right. Was it 2006 to 2008? That sounds about right. I, the newspaper came very good newspaper, The Guardian, my, who I trust and I read them now, um, came to me and said they knew I had teenagers. They said, do you feel you could write something about what, te what it's like living with teenagers? And they even said that. And my first thought was, I don't know whether I can because it would embarrass the children too much at school. Then I said, I think I talked to my husband. Jonathan, who's also a writer, who's very supportive. And he said, well, look, you can only do it if you do it anonymously. You can't possibly put your name on it. And so I said to them, OK, I'll write. I think it was going to be three columns to start with about living with teenagers and I'll do it anonymously. But it must be anonymous. You mustn't tell. In fact, they were told they weren't to tell anybody. I think something like two people at the newspaper knew it was me. Um, and I think that would have been all right, actually. And also I was quite careful. I, the teenagers were... They were definitely based on my kids, but they had different names. They they weren't exactly the same as my kids. They looked different. They had slightly different personalities. Anyway, I mean, to cut a long story short, the column had a massive positive reception and went on for two years, which I never intended. Um, but obviously we were glad, you know, it was, it was rather wonderful that people liked it. And amazingly, the newspaper managed to keep my name out. Of, they managed to keep it anonymous. Again, I think the editor of the whole of that part of the paper didn't even know it was me but obviously people suspected um and the one thing I didn't do and I think I didn't talk about drugs in this column at all and and in fact in, in fact because we were at the same time going through a difficult period with our eldest who yes was becoming addicted to skunk cannabis and it was very hard I was writing the column and so I had to because I wasn't going to write about that I had to almost invent his so the eldest child became a completely fictional character who was fine, who was doing well at school and everything was great. So in that sense, it was quite a fictional column, actually. Um, and it's funny what happened at the same time. Sorry, there's no way of telling this without it being a bit boring, really. I was writing an, a book, a nonfiction book about a Victorian girl called Mary Yellily, who, which was commissioned from me, actually. She was an illustrator and she died at the age of 21. And somebody said to me, would I like to write about her? And I thought, yes, I would, because I want to. I love the idea of investigating a person who died at 21. She left behind a book of watercolour albums. And I suppose I was thinking, what if that's all that's left of a person who died at 21, what else can I find out about this person? I was busy researching that whilst writing Living with Teenagers, whilst dealing with the problem of our son. In fact, it had been going on for a while by then. And I just found myself writing it into the book, The Problem with Our Son. Sounds a bit complicated, but just in snatches, really. And at a certain point, I think I was halfway through the book and I said to Jonathan, my husband, I don't know what to do because I'm writing this book and I don't seem to be able to write it without writing about Jake because it was a book about loss. It was about a mother who'd lost. In fact, she didn't just lose Mary. She lost something like seven or eight of her children to TB. This is the 1840s, I should say. But it was a devastating story. And we were having a very bleak time. And John Jonathan said... Probably very wrongly. He said, write what you have to write and we'll panic about it when you finish the book. <laughs> so I finished the book and I ended up writing a book about our son and cannabis. And I think it's a book, if anyone's, the, pro the real problem with that book is the journalists pounced on it and criticised me before anyone had read it. It wasn't even available for anyone to buy. It, was, it wasn't even in proof. So the story was leaked to a newspaper. So I had the awful... Well, this is the worst aspect of it for me. I was I had a book that was written about by people who hadn't read it. I've always been happy to be criticised for my work, for something I've written. I will always stand up and say, maybe I was wrong or no, I meant well with that. But with this book, people hadn't even seen the book. They couldn't go away and read it. And terrible things were written about me in the press for about six weeks. I think with hindsight, and it was terrible, actually, they, they doorstep my family, my my mother-in-law, my husband's ex-wife. It was just terrible. It was a bad. Wait, wait, wait! 
you mean they doorstep meaning like journalists showed up press. journalists showed up at people's houses to find out bad things about me which they then it, it actually was quite funny there was a headline in the newspaper saying the picture of me saying is this is this britain's worst parent <laughs> it's actually we, well, we laugh about it now it was terrible it was extremely traumatic i'm not really asking for sympathy because i had written the book but nobody had read the book that i'd written anyway the the book nobody bought then then the book did come out nobody bought it it had turned toxic it was terrible but i think it's funny i haven't talked about this my heart races when i talk about this you know because i did after it have a kind of i don't know if you call it a breakdown i became unable to function after this for quite a while but i think the main reason was that i felt such guilt at having done this to our son because what happened was the newspapers am i allowed should i say yeah the daily mail gave him a lot of money they gave him several thousand pounds for his story and he was an addict and he wasn't at home at the time and we weren't giving him money obviously you never give an addict money i mean this is what my book's about and he was given money by them and i felt extremely responsible for that um and i think it damaged him to a certain extent he's fine now we you know we're, we're he's good he's in our lives and he's much better but at the time it was just devastating and i think the the i've never really said this actually i mean the harm i felt i'd done him made me feel that my writing was dangerous in some way even though actually I mean to be honest if anyone you know if you were to read the book it was published in the states and actually the reception in the states was far calmer one or two journalists sort of said you know should she have written this but nobody attacked me as they had with the tabloids in, in what's the name of the book it's called the lost child and it's and the lost child in this book is really Mary Yellily but of course it's our son as well who was temporarily lost at the time I felt I felt I couldn't really write about a mother losing all her children. Well, at the time I felt this without writing about being a mother myself and what I felt about what we were going through. But I think when I look at it now with a sort of cooler head, I think it was it was a misjudgment. I shouldn't have published that book. It was the wrong time. I mean, maybe 30 years later I could have. And, you know, there were important things to be said. But having I mean, having said that, it was only the press who attacked me. So many readers, good people, once it came out, wrote to me, sent me their stories, said how important it is to talk about this stuff. And I did, I should say, there's another reason why, because obviously we didn't, I didn't publish this book without thinking hard. Jonathan and I and the publisher talked about it. We felt there was this crisis of skunk addiction in this country, different from the opioid crisis, but skunk was a, is a very strong form of cannabis. And parents in this country didn't know what it could do to young male brains. And the sort of problems that our son had were happening all over the place and people didn't really know to avoid this and to worry about it so that was part of my um part of why i felt it was all right to publish it at the time but i think i was i gotta in a, say we were in a very I, I gotta say I, well i gotta say that uh i feel i felt when i was when i was reading about this and like reading about skunk cannabis it made me feel old because yeah. i was like i smoked pot when i was younger i felt like i smoked fairly strong pot but like nothing that really rose to the level of this like in terms of its impact is there a, is there a new weed that think... i'm not aware of <laughs> oh yes no there is do, do you not know about skunk i mean I, we obviously we weren't aware of it either no the, the, the pot that well we called it what we called we called it dope when i was at university that the boys i didn't i tried it once but i didn't really smoke it i've never done drugs but the boys i shared a house with smoked dope and it was that's marijuana that's far far less strong the i forgot actually, i've forgotten all the details now but this is in the book the thc content of skunk which is actually what most young people on the streets of britain certainly now will be buying skunk when they buy their cannabis because they'll all say to you oh no mum i know where it's from it's it's not strong it's from this really nice guy who sells it to me but it tends to be skunk it damages the frontal lobes of the of a young male brain particularly men actually it has i think it can make young women very anxious but with men it can actually do damage something to do with their frontal lobes not being fully formed or something at the time we investigated all of this and yeah it's very i mean i'm surprised you don't know about that actually it's i mean fact, i'm i'm just in my I garage it, i think i'm tuned <laughs> out <laughs> i think it was an american friend actually a friend living in new york who first got us to talk to an expert about it about but anyway i don't I sort of I try actually the reason I'm <laughs> I try not to talk about this too much because these days because it's very hard to talk about it without talking about our son, and obviously I haven't talked about our son for years in this way and I don't, um, and it, and it's why it's super ironic that I ended up writing a book. This novel is about drug addiction. I never thought I'd touch that subject again, 
but somehow it felt like time. Um, but yes, but so as you were saying, I do have background here. Um, you know, I've got a record. So people, I knew how people would approach this book. And I knew it's true. I mean, several journalists in this country who interviewed me when it came out 18 months ago said, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And, you know, I can't really answer that question. It's a novel. It's not about my son. It's about a girl. I, I have a daughter who's nothing like the girl in the book. The daughter is a completely fictional character. She's nothing like any of my children. But yet I can see her very vividly, that daughter. As I wrote about her, I really knew that girl. I knew that child very well. Um, and I, th I think I would say it's definitely fiction. But of course, I couldn't have written it if I hadn't, if we hadn't been through what we went through. Yeah, so I think that's I mean, it, how I approach it. I, obviously, I couldn't have written it and wouldn't have written it. But well, it's, an, it's an extraordinary it set of circumstances. It's an extraordinary set of circumstances that you had to endure as a writer who became kind of tabloid fodder or whatever. The press really yeah. came after you in a personal way. And totally I, did, think, yeah. I think that's why the title nonfiction does have an element of provocation to it. And there is something. It does like creatively courageous and logical from my perspective about you kind of revisiting this subject matter in this novel. And I think you've said something like, uh, what is the quote I have written down? I'm addicted to trying to be as truthful as possible about the world that I see around me. <laughs> well, I am. Yes. I, that's the only reason I, I write. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think that's why most of us do it one way or another. And I have to say that from a writerly perspective, this notion that you would live live through something like you've lived through and not write about it somehow or make art about it somehow, mm. that, oh, that just seems, that seems uh, illogical to me. Of course you're going to, like, how could you not is the question. Yeah, that's that it's nice of you to say that. I think, because I think what really happened is, truthfully, after those, it's 2009, I really did fall apart. When I say fall apart, I, I couldn't. I, I found I couldn't drive our car down the street. I ha had to pull in and stop and Jonathan had to come and get me because, and I know what it was, I felt dangerous. I felt like I was going to hurt somebody actually. Then I couldn't get on a bus because I felt trapped. And then I found the funniest one. I couldn't get on an escalator in a department store because there was something about that, that I don't know, the, tri the trip you have to take up an escalator. I felt like something terrible was going to happen. And obviously this is the definition of someone having a bit of a, you know a small mental breakdown and I went off and did some meditation a six-week meditation course my doctor sent me for and it which saved me actually it took away didn't get rid of my anxiety but it helped me deal with it and slowly you know I wrote another book I wrote a novel called then and I slowly began to become myself again and our son was all right and you know the family felt all right again and I think things felt whole and I think all this time passed and it's true I suddenly a year or two ago, I began to feel braver, actually. And I think I'm quite angry about what happened. And I hadn't, I'm not a very easily angry person in the sense that I'm not, I'm, I'm never very conscious of experiencing anger. It's the one emotion that I don't particularly, I probably do feel angry, but I don't, I'm not conscious of it. And I, I partly perhaps because I do channel things into writing. But I think when I was writing this book, I was suddenly feeling quite brave. And I think that, as I was saying to you, it was a sort of thing of, okay, come and get me. I'm ready for you now. Come and get me. This is a this is a fictional novel. If you want to take me up on the fact that, yes, it touches on things I've experienced, do that. Do that if you want to. And I was ready for that. And I think also, I mean, I was actually, as I was finishing it, um, I did actually have breast cancer three years ago. And I was literally writing the final edits whilst just before having a mastectomy. And weirdly, so by the time it came out, yes, it came, after, by the time it came out, I'd been through breast cancer and I'm all right, touch wood. Um, but that also made me brave. You know, there's nothing like, a brush with something like that you it puts things in proportion and I felt actually I wish that what happened about the lost child could happen to me now because I'd handle it so much better I would be much less afraid I think um although of course it was because I felt I was protecting my family that I became so afraid um I feel I have less to lose now in a way anyway I'm already the worst parent in Britain so what's what's to lose <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say nowhere to go but up right <laughs> that's I mean that's yes. that's an unbelievable thing for a writer to go through and you just wonder why the press fixated on that was there one particular written reaction to the rumor of the book i mean these people had not even read the book right as you said yes so yes i it's funny no that they were in a way i mean it was fascinating the way it happened because 
it really was a leak. It was a leak. Someone leaked a very, a very nice benign little piece. You know, the bookseller, like you're a bit like Publishers Weekly that you have. They do a little thing about books up and coming for next year. So, so there was a little bit about it and someone leaked that to a paper and immediately it's the tabloids of you know the daily mail is terrible they immediately smelt blood they thought this is there's a story here and they did actually ask me for an interview right then and i said no because we'd agreed we wouldn't do any i wasn't going to do any publicity or talk about our son i just wanted the book to stand for itself sink or swim exactly as it was but because of that that got their you know that got them more excited and um they then tracked down people talked to our son but what was i going to say yes that is funny in a way the tabloids over here, they always behave like that. And perhaps we should have expected it. But I think what really hurt, you know, there are people, novelists who write columns. And I've been a novelist who wrote, in fact, I wrote two columns a while ago. Um, in fact, I've written three columns in my life. They're looking for things to write about. And so they wrote about it. But So several writers, I'm not going to name them, but it was infuriating, wrote about my book and what they thought about it without having read it. And that is something I would never do. You know, the idea of writing about a fellow writer's book that you haven't read. Um, so that was terrible. And they, they just looked at what was said in the tabloids and regurgitated it. So that was very bruising, actually. That was the worst part of it in some ways. Anyway, well, it's a long time ago now. And I'm quite, it's, so it's well over 10 years ago. I think at the time, I could not see how we could ever recover from it. I felt the damage I'd done to my family and my children was irreversible, actually. Um and I suppose I wasn't sure I'd be able to write anything ever again. And it's amazing to to realise now that, you know, we are, are the family is fine. I'm still writing. I, I'm amazed that we were able to come back from it, but we were. But I had a lot of support. And I should say I, I had a lot of support from good friends. You know, when something like that happens, you certainly discover who your friends are. And nearly all of them stood by me. One or two didn't. And it's really interesting when you find one or two don't. But, um, you know, I had a lot of support, actually, as well. People yeah. wrote things in defence of me as well. Oh, anyway, well, that's lovely. <laughs> and I think yes. that I think that it's important to just have that framework for people so that they can understand nonfiction as a, a creative work in its own right. And yeah. I love I love the idea of you coming back and writing this book and sort of sticking your chin out and saying like have at me, you know, like <laughs> I feel like writers ha like artists absolutely have to have the freedom to uh, explore mm. like things that are per deeply personal to them. It just seems crazy to start setting up rules. Well, I mean, obviously you never want to damage, you know, you don't want to intentionally hurt somebody with your work, but there is kind of a fine line. And I think most people, underst most people understand that artists have to have creative freedom mm. in that way. And that most artists are working in good faith. But and I wonder whether, I think there's a bit of a taboo around mothers, you know, I, I think mothers, there are things mothers aren't supposed to do, particularly, maybe it's better now because I'm a bit older, so I'm no longer kind of one of those mothers. But I was, you know, I was only 45, 46 at the time. And very, you know, you're you're not supposed to do these things as a mother, I don't think. I think some, there was some of that in the tabloid response anyway. Sorry, though, I interrupted what you were saying. Though. Mm, oh, it's an important point. Yeah. And I think it also speaks to the experience that you had in the aftermath where suddenly you couldn't drive a car. I mean, I can imagine, I mean, look, if somebody called into question my conduct as a father, that would be deeply hurtful to me and would be yeah. traumatic. And I mean, to be a mother and to have your ability to be a good mother called into question, to be called the worst mother in Britain or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. That's that's a lot to process. And I think I gets... think what was worst about it was that I actually felt they were right in my darkest moments. I thought they were right. I did at the time. Mm. Well, speaking of that, the mother in your novel nonfiction <laughs> and, and her husband are struggling with their daughter who is deep in the throes of addiction and is in and out of their house, is mostly out of their house, living wherever, you know, on the mm. streets or in people's apartments or wherever she is, they don't really know. And mm -hmm. there is a real painful sense of what it is like for parents of children who are struggling in this way, that sense of helplessness. It felt really true to life. And it's a, 
sadly, it's an experience that a lot of parents go through. This is not some isolated thing. Like this is all over the no. place. And I think like what it brought home to me is the fact that when your child is struggling with addiction, like the advice, the professional advice that you get is to not help them, like help them if they want to go to rehab. But like, like you said earlier, don't give them money. No. Uh, you don't provide them with what it's like a false comfort almost because it only will exacerbate the problem and perpetuate the cycle of addiction. Right. Yeah. It's the worst. I think I do say it in the book, actually, it's the only illness because it, it is an illness really that where you the only thing you are able no you are actively told to push your child away and I can't think of any other thing you know my children have been through all sorts of difficult experiences actually and things where I've been able to help them or try to help them and we've all worried together and we've been able to offer comfort and love and take care of them and you're not able to do that in fact you're actively told not to and if the child rings your doorbell saying I just want to talk to you you're, you're supposed to say, no, unless unless you're coming to talk about getting clean and going to rehab, I won't speak to you about it, about anything. And we were actually, you know, we, yes, sorry, I don't want to be too specific actually about a son. I think it's not fair. I've talked and written enough about him, but yes, it's the most painful experience imaginable. And I also think it kind of, there are the parents who've, who've done it and been through it and the parents who haven't. And I think the ones who haven't, bless them, they, they have no idea what that feels like. It's like a place they haven't been to. It's a dark side. It's an abyss that you almost can't imagine if you haven't been there. And and I should also say, actually, I didn't set out to write this novel thinking, oh, it's time I wrote about addiction and I feel brave enough now. Not at all. I think it's more I was writing, trying to I was writing a novel and there were all sorts of other things in it which aren't in it now. Embarrassing things. It was about something quite different, actually, in a way. And I this is how I write novels. I sort of write and I write. And as soon as it begins to feel more truthful, and more exciting I go with it kind of thing but I don't sit down and plan anything and this bit the stuff about addiction the stuff actually that the novel starts with about locking a child into the house because they're trying to get clean which we did go through um suddenly when I wrote that down I thought yes I want to I need to write this I need to write this down and that's that beginning of the novel which is very true in my mind um is what catapulted me into writing about it uh, but again, you know, as often, I mean, I, I don't know whether people believe me when I say this, but I was sort of almost startled to find I was writing about this because you could say it still wasn't a very good idea <laughs> at this stage. But sorry, I can't remember what we were saying. Yes, I think I that wilderness, you know, it's, it's a terrible bl black wilderness that parents are in who've been through this. And I have met and talked to over the years other parents who've had similarly addicted children. We all immediately know each other. We can immediately talk to each other. And it's a dialogue that you can't really have with anyone else because family and friends, they they're so well-meaning, but they don't understand. Um, you know, they actually are embarrassed sometimes. I even put a bit in the book where, you know, I, I think I put a bit where I say I can imagine a day might come where they might say, how's your daughter? And you'd say, oh, she died. And they'd say, oh, well, how's your work going or something? You know, people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to engage with it. And I wanted to write about that loneliness i, I was gonna it's say book, it's a book about loneliness actually in a weird way yes yes i was gonna say the way that you depict the isolation of this couple as they cope mm. with their daughter's addiction is really spot on uh, because like you say people who are not going through this why is it I, this is a question i often ask why is it so hard for human beings to imagine the circumstances of other human beings. It feels like a failure of imagination <laughs> and it wouldn't even really be that hard. Like, oh my gosh, these people have a daughter who is struggling with this deadly illness and has gone from the home and they're really sad about it. Like that seems like not too big of a leap to have to make imaginatively to try to understand and empathize with somebody. And yet, like you say, people don't want to talk about it. They don't even want to engage. No, I think they're either they're either frightened, and I think this is what some of the attacks on the lost child were. People are are frightened. They don't want to know about something that might happen to them, or that they might be under their noses and they haven't worried enough about, or guarded enough against. And I think there was a bit of a witch burning when I wrote the lost child. You know, let's get rid, let's cancel this woman. Actually, cancelling wasn't even heard of then, but thank God. But let's cancel this woman, and then this won't happen to us because she's wrong. She's bad. She shouldn't have said this about her son. 
there was an element of that. But I think, to be fair, I think people are frightened. But I think also, and they're frightened in the same way that they are when you have cancer. But I think they're, they're also, they're quite well-meaning people are on the whole. I think they want to be able to say something and they sometimes think I won't say the right thing, so I'll say nothing. And actually, of course, we all know that when someone's going through a hard time, you must say something, always say something, don't say nothing. And don't say, I did, I did actually even have people come up to me after, a couple of years after the lost child and say, when I was reinstated as a good person again, and say, oh, I've really <laughs> felt for you. I thought about saying something, but I wasn't sure what to say. Or I thought you'd be inundated with emails, all this kind of thing. You know, and you think to yourself, yeah, that's so much the wrong response in my view. You should go and say something to people. But I don't know whether humans lack imagination. I think they're, humans are such frail, scared little creatures, actually. If they haven't, and also if they haven't been through difficult things, some people, some people are very lucky, their families, I think I wrote about this in the book too. You know, you see these people with children who all seem perfectly fine and everyone loves each other and it all seems wonderful. And their biggest problem is, you know, the piano teacher hasn't turned up or something. You know, it's unimaginable to me, but, you know, some people have very easy lives and good for That's them. That's true. That's true. <laughs> and I know from doing a bit of research that you personally uh, did not have the easiest childhood or relationships with your parents. Yeah. Uh, and there is uh, a very memorable dynamic between mother and daughter in this novel yeah and it is a very strained and difficult but loving relationship and there is a, a section of the novel where the narrator is on better terms with her mother and i wish yeah. i could like quote it but it's beautifully written and it's like when she's in hospital yeah when she's in the hospital, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. she has a mother, and her mother in this kind of weakened state is warmer and even like genuinely affectionate, mm. and she and the narrator suddenly feels the love of her mother, and mm. it buoys her in such a way that she's elated and she's carrying yeah. herself different in a very fundamental yes. and powerful way in the world, and it brings home a very important point that people who lack this sort of basic love and affection from their parents are moving through the world. Uh, it's like, uh, I don't want to say like it is at a disadvantage. It's almost like you're being weighted down or there's this great absence. Mm. And the rest of us whose parents loved us, however flawed, you know, everybody's flawed. Mm. Nobody's a perfect parent, but yeah. that basic love and care, we take it for granted. People yeah. have parents who are loving and caring, take it for granted. And to think of what it would be like to be alive in the absence of that, that's what it yeah. made me realize. Oh, that's so, exactly, yeah. That's exactly what I was trying to write about. I, And that is true. I had both my parents. I mean, I luckily I can talk about my mother because she died while I was writing the book, actually. I don't know. She would have hated this book, even though, as you say, it is a loving relationship in some ways. I tried really hard in this book to find, I have massive sympathy for her because she had a terrible upbringing, a terrible, lonely childhood. She literally was sent away to boarding school at the age of five. So the, the mother strand is actually all true in the sense that I didn't have to make anything up. And it, all the facts there are true. They really happened. And in a way, they're the most extraordinary, I think, in the book. But um, I was trying to find, uh, uh, yeah, I was, what to say? I think I was still processing my relationship with my mother and then her death while I was writing the book. Um, it is true that I have never had um, I've never had that thing that some people have, well, you, maybe you have, of knowing that I've got two parents who always loved me and always did the best for me, even if it wasn't, you know, like you say, flawed. Neither of them, they both disliked me from quite an early age. I was problematic for them. They, my father rejected me completely by the time I was 18 and he killed himself later. But, and he, he is in the book too, but, and that's also true what's in the book. But my mother, too, she didn't reject me, but she competed with me, hated my writing, wanted me to do badly. She used to read out my bad reviews to me, things like that. And it was a very difficult relationship. And I only really got some some sort of peace in the end by slightly estranging myself from her, which made me feel very guilty always. And when she died, it felt very, very sad. And I wasn't with her when she died. And she asked she said don't call they didn't want she didn't want anyone to call me and I was banned from attending her funeral which also felt incredibly difficult much more difficult than I thought it would in fact um I've lost my track here yeah and so in the book if funnily enough the hospital thing it did really happen but slightly differently because she had a stroke a few years ago 
a sudden stroke out of nowhere, a mild stroke. And it changed her completely. She got her sense of humour back and she started loving me again. And I had about two years when, and it's exactly as described in that, although I don't mention the stroke, she, I knew what it was to have a mother again. And it was extraordinary how, as you're saying, it changed everything for me. It changed the way I felt when I walked around the house. It's, it changed the way I thought about things when I was out shopping and I would see things and think, oh my God, I could, I could get that for mum. And it was wonderful. And what happened was it lasted for, well, almost two years. And then very slowly she went back to how she'd been. And I think it must be, I don't know whether, it must be a recognised brain thing. Something altered in her brain after the stroke and then went back to how it had been before. And it You're was like, like can, can you can you have another mild stroke? Would that be possible? <laughs> well, it's, like, it's I, possible. I, I, I mean, yes, she may have had another mild stroke. It was really, and it was so, I mean, it sounds a bit like something in a novel, actually. The idea that this mother, I had a conversation with her on the phone because our relationship was mended. It was entirely mended. And she seemed to love me. And I think she did love me. I know my mother loved me. She was able to be with me and be kind and caring and hug me and say nice things about me. She was excited about, you know, my books and things that I did. And I had never really had that. And I'd never had it. And it was so awful. I had one conversation with her on the phone. And there was some, there was a coldness in her voice. And I put the phone down and said to Jonathan, it's changed. She's changed. It's coming back. And it was, it's very hard to explain what this coldness was. It would be a sort of, she used to have this tone of voice, which was sort of, she was waiting for me to do something wrong. She was waiting for me to say something that would, she could criticize. And it was a really, I was always on edge. And as a child, actually, I was as well. I was quite frightened of both my parents. Um, and I think what happened after my mother's stroke is I relaxed for two years. And it was amazing to relax and to not be worried about what, what I was going to do or say, that it might worry, offend her in some way. Um, so, yes, I put all of that into the book. I just found myself putting it in. And... Well, I will say as a reader that as tough of a character as the mother is in this novel, I too found her very sympathetic. So oh, good. I'm really you... glad about that because, no, because yeah. one or two, one or two reviewers or somebody, people have called her a monster. And it's really funny. I hate to hear someone call her a monster because she's my mom and I loved her. And actually I do. I still think about her. I think about her grave, the way I say in the book. I think about, I think about her a lot. And um, yes, I hate her to be called a mom. So I would love to feel that she comes over as sympathetic. She had such a deprived, miserable, neglectful childhood. And she, I don't think anyone really taught her how to be a parent, actually. She was only 21 when she had me. Not quite 21, actually. Yeah. Well, I think, and it's I really think nice that's... that you feel that. Well, yeah. I think most writers would want their characters to be round and to have dimension and yeah. I think you humanize that character, like for as as tough as she can be and as mean as she can be, as readers, we get to learn why. And yes. you can't help but feel heartbroken for mm. a kid at five years old who gets shipped away to boarding school. No. I mean, I cannot even exactly. imagine. I think I think my mother was a bully, but but we all know that bullies are actually scared, aren't they? They're scared people. So I think she was scared and she was always scared. I think fear drove almost everything she did and it's it's hard I think and I think it was it made me very because of my upbringing I, I think I I was I've been always been quite a maternal person I've been very I always wanted babies I love children and when I met Jonathan and we had three babies I think I had such a I felt that I might be undoing all that difficult stuff which I think is why what we went through with drugs and stuff felt even worse actually it's like something happened to our family the family I was so sure we'd managed to build and keep safe something happened to it which of course as a parent you blame yourself and I think so parental guilt something I've written about a lot in all my novels if I actually you know it's funny when people accuse me of being the worst mother in Britain and everything there's nothing actually that's an old I shouldn't keep saying that because that was an old headline but um, there's that there isn't a single thing I've ever been accused of that I haven't already accused myself of somewhere in my books actually and I think that is right. true Right. I'm, well, yeah, I'm very can, self I, self lacerating. Actually, is what I'm the call same it, way. But I am. I'm the same yeah. way. I'm the same way. I'm like my own worst critic. I think a lot of us are yeah. this way. And yeah. you know, to have been through as much as you've been through, like as just as a child, you know, having parents who were difficult to say the least, and your father took mm -hmm. his own life. Like later in your life, I believe you were 30 when that happened. It was the, the night, the night my daughter was born, he killed himself. That complete I mean, accident. It was New Year's Eve, but yeah. So I read in reading about this that you have never done proper therapy. And 
Mm-hmm. That that is interesting to me, but I, you know, that's everybody's choice. If you want to do therapy or not, I don't mm-hmm. care. I think the question that I have for you <laughs> is related to the making of art and whether or not you feel like you derive therapeutic benefit from the books that you write. Because you do address this stuff on the page, as we've been discussing. Mm-hmm. There is a mother character that is related or inspired by your mother. There's a father character that's inspired by your father. And you kind of go at this stuff on the page in nonfiction. But you also, in your body of work, have made a habit of writing about things that you find difficult to imagine happening. You yeah. write into your fear as I a do, general practice. Yeah, that's very true. And I'm just wondering how you make sense of it. Like, because it's the, the kind of stuff that you went through as a kid and the kind of parents that you had would send most people to the couch, I feel like, with, to talk to somebody. But <laughs> yes. you've managed to make it through and to be a functional adult and a loving mother and to have a happy marriage and all this kind of stuff uh, in the absence of it. Do you feel like the art is the thing that allows you to move through and to get perspective and to uh, maintain some semblance of mental health, you know, despite having been through all this stuff and despite not having like a therapist? Oh, it's a complicated question with a complicated answer. I mean, I haven't ruled out therapy. In fact, my youngest son is really feels that I ought to have some therapy. I think he feels he's, he's now 30, but he's, he's read all my books and he's, He's worried. He worries sometimes and says, "Mom, you need to talk about this to someone." I haven't ruled out home therapy, um, I, although I did actually see a very, very wise counsellor a few years ago, soon after the lost child stuff, who was very good about giving me permission not to feel responsible for my mother, which I really needed someone to tell me that. You know, sometimes there's therapy, and then there's a wise person just saying the most obvious thing to you that no one's ever said, and she said, "This is an unhappy, angry woman, but you're not responsible for her unhappiness or her anger." And it was like a light bulb went on in my head. And I thought, no, I'm not. But I needed to be told that. It was, wasn't obvious to me. Um, in terms of writing, I think you're absolutely right. I have always written about the darkest things I can, the, the things that frighten me are what I write about. Um, I just do. For some reason, that drives my writing. And I do think being allowed to do that, and, you know, I'm so lucky being published, being able to just about make a living out of it for all these years has, has kept me happy. I'm not happy if I'm not writing and I need to write my novels. And I think there's a huge element of, of mental health benefit there. There's no question. I'm a happier person when I'm writing. Um, But I don't think it's therapy because really it's a bit what this novel is about, because I don't think I could be trusted to tell the truth about my story. I think the things I write down, even in this novel, yes, to the best of my ability, I'm, staring into the abyss and pulling out things that feel true and I certainly really sweat over that I work hard over that but that's not the same as what a therapist might ask me about or tease out of me or make me think about perhaps and you know I'm in charge I think that's the other thing I'm in charge of my novels aren't I so that's not therapy because I'm 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 running the show and I can say anything I want and I can you know I love my one of my favorite things in the world is trying to make the unconvincing convincing that's what I love doing I really love doing that, actually. I've often, in the past, some of my novels have been love stories, and I like to think of the least possible love story and then make someone feel it and write a story like that. I've loved writing things like that. Um, so I don't think they'd, it is therapy, and I imagine that if I ever do have therapy, which I might, I'd find it a lot harder and perhaps not enjoy it very much and find it more uncomfortable. Um, and maybe that's maybe that makes me frightened a bit. Maybe I'm not quite brave enough to have therapy. Um, and you're right, I have a very happy marriage and I love my kids and they're all OK now and they're wonderful children. But I wouldn't say my life has been straightforward. I might have had a sort of less unhappiness. There has been unhappiness. Maybe I'd have had less if I had therapy. I don't know. But but I don't know. I'm a real optimist. I'm always excited about life. I love life. That's the other thing. I'm not I've never, ever suffered from depression. I'm quite the opposite. I wake up every single morning excited for the world. And that's been true, actually, whatever we're going through. So um, maybe that's another reason I haven't looked to have therapy. But maybe I don't think I trust, should... I don't trust my writing as therapy. Maybe I should Maybe watch. you should write a novel about a woman who goes to therapy. That could be the solution. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> I think the, tr- the, other, the other trouble is I don't find therapy very interesting. It's a bit like people who write about their dreams. You know, it's sort of like, 
I like writing about people who are really up against it and having to make decisions in real life with real people. And that's never what therapy is, is it? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I guess like maybe there could be some component or some, some uh, like uh, side story connected mm. to the therapy that could potentially fulfill that I role. Do, but... I do think actually, I do think both my parents needed therapy. My father was very depressed and I think, and I was too young to sort of really realize it and too wrapped up in my own family. And I think both of them, could have should have had therapy and I think the difference between them and me actually is I would say both of them were unhappy and I'm not unhappy it is true that I'm not unhappy I think I think that's the one thing I can truthfully say I'm I'm a very happy person I'm not but it, but I'm also complicated and difficult and you know <laughs> and got, got problems but I am happy I love do you think life. that's do I you think life. that's because do you think that's because of just like lucky neurology like neurochemistry yeah, I was or... born like this. In fact, I used to irritate my mother. She used to call me Pollyanna. She used to say, "Why are you always so in such a good mood about everything?" And so that was another <laughs> thing I was. That's another thing I was blamed for, actually. <laughs> um, but I was. I was like that right from a child. I used to get up early, go off on walks across the fields. I thought everything was wonderful. I loved my life. I mean, I was exactly the same as I am now, actually. So yeah. Okay, so I want to <laughs> talk to you. I want to shift gears a bit, and I want to yeah. talk to you about your writing life. And mm -hmm. something that I read about you that charmed me was that teenage Julie Meyerson was shy, but would exchange letters with authors. You would write to your <laughs> to authors that you admired, including yes. Daphne du Maurier. Like, can du you Maurier. talk about the the writers that you wrote to and what those exchanges yeah. were like? I was. I don't know where that came from. I was. I was about thirteen when I first wrote to Daphne du Maurier. I was. I was a third. No, when I was about nine. I, I ought to say, I grew up in a family where no one had even been to, both my parents left school at the age of 15. No one had been to university. I was the first person to go to university. That's later on. But, and I was a child, you know, I wasn't especially good at school. I loved reading. And actually my mother did make me read. She she got me excited about reading. So she, I owe her something for that. Um, and I, I remember reading, I read um, my, my mother's great big fat book of William Shakespeare had I read Twelfth Night in that and I was about nine years old sitting on the carpet in my bedroom I remember it really well and I can't have understood a word of it I was nine I just read this play and then at the end of it I literally remember thinking I could do that and so that was where I decided to be a writer and I was literally nine years old and by the time I was sort of 10 11 12 then I was a huge reader by then but still not not really doing very well at school I mean I was you know I was medium at school I wasn't amazing English or anything I was terrible at science and I wasn't that good at English and I read I think I was reading Daffy de Maurier I used to bring her books home from the library and it just never occurred to me that she wouldn't want to get a letter from me so I wrote a letter care of her publishers and I think I said I've still got her letters now but I said something like dear Daphne I do like your books I think you're a very good writer and by the way here's a drawing I've done of one of your I think it's my cousin Rachel I sent her a drawing of and and and, and she wrote, the thing is, she wrote, I remember then waiting and waiting and waiting, sitting in Nottingham in our, in our house for a letter to come through the letterbox. And sure enough, a letter came through the letterbox with St. Austell, where she lived on it. And it was a postcard from her saying, I really like your drawing and thank you for the, thank you very much for your card. And it had, that's right, thank you very much for your letter. I love the drawing. And the card she sent me had her address at the top. So of course, I wrote another letter straight back to her. <laughs> and she was crazy she sent me her address and so basically over about it was over a couple of years actually we exchanged about I got about six or seven letters from her letters and cards and I must have been so one of them says dear Julie congratulations on your O-level results in other words I must have written to her telling her all my exam results <laughs> amazing I don't know where I got that kind of self-belief from but you know she, and she was wonderful and I much later I made a radio um, program about her and got to meet her son Kit and actually I got to go to the house that she was living in when she was writing to me at one of the times and have dinner there and I was so we went to have dinner there it was the it was a festival for Daffy Demore I was a grown-up writer by now and when we got back to our hotel room I just burst into tears because I couldn't believe this had really happened to me because the 14 year old me would have just been so overwhelmed can you imagine it oh, having I mean, dinner in yeah. Daffy Demore's house so I never met her and then meanwhile, yes, I wrote off to John Betchman, who was the, have you heard of him? He was the Poet Laureate. I've got a letter from him. I don't know how many times I wrote to him, but I've got a letter from him saying, dear Julie, that's up there on, on my shelf, saying, dear Julie, your, your letter arrived just when poets are feeling most low, straight after breakfast. And it cheered me up immensely. And, I, and he, he praised my poems. I'd often sent him a great sheaf of poems. And he wrote about my poems. 
an amazing these the generosity of these people and i have never ever not replied to a fan letter i'm not that i get that many but i have never ever not replied to somebody who writes to me well i was going to say i was going to say so much well when you said earlier that you were 13 years old and you were just certain that daphne du maurier was uh hoping or would be delighted to get a letter from you here's the truth (laughs) here's the truth she yeah. was delighted. Any writer is delighted <laughs> to hear from readers. I don't I mean, know. I mean, there she, are she very used, few. But she used to get so many letters. Actually, I found this out later from Kit, her son, when I met him. She used to get sackfuls of letters, actually. She did. She was. Mm. She did write back to all of them. But, you know, I, yeah, there was, I think he, I was the only one. I mean, <laughs> it's very, very sweet, though, isn't it? It was hugely inspiring to me because it did make me think I was going to be a writer. And it's sad she died before my first novel was published. But of course, I would have loved to have sent her my first novel. And I would have done. And she wouldn't have remembered who I was, obviously. I wonder where her papers are kept. I wonder if maybe your old letters from childhood are somewhere buried in her papers. You could read what you said. They probably are, aren't they? Well, I I half know what I said because of her replies. That's what I mean, is I know I sent her my O-level results because she thanks me for them. Um, she, and she said to me a lovely thing. She said, I hope you get to live in your dream house one day because Menabilly was mine. You know, Menabilly that my, um, Rebecca is set in. I think it's Rebecca that's set in Menabilly. Is it? I can't remember. Anyway, Menabilly was the house she really loved, which she didn't stay in, in fact. But I love Daffy de Murray. I have actually written the introductions to several new editions of her books. I mean, a few years ago now. And it was wonderful to be able to do that. I think she's such a modern writer. But she's not underrated exactly. But people don't realise how dark she is and how... How sort of there's, there's a she's very modern. There's a modern tone to her books, I think. Hmm. Yeah, I love her. Well, I, I mentioned earlier the various or some of the various themes at play in your novel: addiction, adultery, uh, marriage, parenthood, mothers and daughters, and just to continue on the line of conversation that we're on. Uh, we're not going to get to all of them, but I do want to talk a bit more about writing because this book is, as you said, I think you you consider it primarily to be a book about writing in, a way. in some ways. I, perhaps that's how I want to see it anyway. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. there are things that I wrote down. I wrote down a few of the things that the character, uh, you know, the narrator in this book, who is an author, says about writing. And I want to, I'm assuming you share these opinions. I could be I wrong. Do. No, I do. I do but share them. Yeah. I want to I want to read some of them aloud and then have us discuss them because I okay. think a lot of people who listen to this show are writerly and would probably be interested to hear. So, one of the things she says is, quote, writing a novel is often about narrowing your focus, making choices, eliminating things. And remember that you don't need to explain the whole narrative either, not to the reader, not even to yourself. Much of the real energy of a book often comes from the things that aren't said or entirely understood, sometimes even by the author herself. Yes, I believe every word of that. In fact, it was interesting. It's the first time ever that I've allowed myself to write about writing because I have tended to think in the past, and maybe to some extent still do think, that books about writers are boring you know, give the, give the person a proper job. <laughs> Don't write about a writer. So here I gave myself permission. Well, again, it, like all the decisions in my books, it just seemed to come. It seemed to be necessary to write about a writer. Um, and yes, I do believe that. So I think it's very, mm. but something you said earlier in our conversation had to do with not really knowing when you're working on a book, particularly in an early draft, mm-hmm. not really knowing what it is. No, I... And, I Sorry, carry on. Yes. Well, I guess a question is like, to what degree do you not know? Like if you sat down to write this novel nonfiction, you had to have some sense that it was going to deal with the themes at play, right? Or did you just like, I don't no, I don't I understand actually... fully what you mean by not knowing <laughs> yes. what you're writing about. <laughs> because I, I, I started writing a book that it wasn't obviously called nonfiction, but what, I mean, how do I do it? I, I start writing something comes into my head, an idea, a scene, an image, something unexplained, something I don't really know what it is. And I see if I can write and see if it excites me. And with this one, I actually started, if I tell you that this book, I don't know if I should admit this, it originally had something to do with vampires. (laughs) This book began as a book that was slightly about vampires. That shows you how far I've come (laughs) by the time I finish nonfiction. And for a while that was working actually, or I thought it was. Um, but it wasn't. 
but I think I was wanting to write something dark about about young people or teenagers and and that's how I somehow I, I really can't say I wish I often wish there could be a camera on a writer because I'd like to see how certain writers wrote the books they wrote but I I don't make any notes I don't plan anything and I started to write the scene as I said about locking the daughter in the house and realized what I was writing realized I was writing about something I'd experienced and that's when it started to change as a book and slowly the vampire stuff went but I do think that's right I've always felt I think this is in the book actually that I don't some writers write because they know what they want to say and I don't think there's anything wrong with that many great writers write for that reason and then other writers and I don't think I'm the only one write in order to find out what they want to say and I definitely write in order to find out if I knew what I wanted to say I wouldn't really see any point in writing the book. In fact, years ago, I think it was my third or fourth novel, my husband, who's, who was a writer before me, he's really a dramatist, but he has published a couple of novels. He said, you know, you if you didn't spend all this time not knowing, just writing and writing and not knowing, you'd write your books much faster. He said, why don't you write a plan? And I was young enough and inexperienced enough that I believed him and I listened. And so I went away and wrote a plan of a novel and I showed it to him. And he said, brilliant, write it. It's a really good plot, it's a really good idea. And I went away, of course, and wrote a whole different book because why would I write that book when I'd already written the plot? I just wouldn't. I, I have to surprise myself with my writing. I have to not know what's going to happen. And I do have to be in the dark, as you in the, that quote you just read out. I need to be in the dark as much as the reader to some extent. And I, sometimes it's not until a book's published. In fact, sometimes it's not until a book's reviewed. It, when a reviewer writes about, sometimes a reviewer has written about the themes of one of my books and said, she, she, as usual, it's about this or that and that. And I sometimes think to myself, oh, yes, it is. But I hadn't realised that. It just hadn't right. even occurred to me. So sometimes it isn't until somebody reviews a book and tells me what it's about that I even know. I mean, I'm being a bit, that's not obviously entirely true, but it's kind of true. I don't, I just follow my nose. I kind of, um, it, it's, I just literally put one word in front of another and, and I must say, I am very, words are why I write. I am very excited by sentences, by the effect of one word or an, on another. I spend, I'm right in the middle of a novel now. And I'm actually, I think I've gone over the sentences I'm working on at the moment. Oh, I don't know, well over a hundred times. I mean, that much, that many times, changing words back and forth, making them feel right to me, making the tone feel right, making them feel true, but also making them feel exciting enough for me to work write the next sentence. And that's how I write. And I spent ages and ages. And I hardly ever, I've never started a novel and not finished it because I never would, because obviously, because it's more like a problem I have to solve. So I'll write and write and write and keep going until the vampire novel turns into this novel and then it starts to work. So I'll just, I'll never abandon a book because the book I'm writing is the problem. It's what I am at that time, if that makes sense. Well. Yeah, it does make sense. <laughs> yes. And I feel like I feel like what you just described shows up on the page. For people listening who have not had a chance to read, nonfiction is just so beautifully written. And there is a music oh, to it that I loved and that felt consistent page after page, line by line. And you keep talking about recognizing when you're excited by what you're writing. Mm. And I think this is part of the skill of the writer that maybe doesn't get talked about enough is being able to self-evaluate. And yes. just having that intuitive sense or that kind of visceral sense of when, like knowing when something is working. Some of yes. us are better at that than others. And so you agree. seem to be, you seem to be tuned in to when yeah. you are experiencing a sense of excitement. And that is the barometer for how you know yeah. when a piece of writing is worth pursuing. It absolutely is. I think I'm, I've always felt that I'm a very, very good editor of myself. And I know instantly whether something's a bit phony, a bit baggy, a bit not needing to be there, or or whether it's something that's making me sit up and take, you know, take notice and say, yes, yes, this is going somewhere. This feels, it is sort of about truth, actually, because I think I'm very impatient with other people's writing, by the way. I'm terrible. I'm such a picky reader, but I, I need to feel that I am being grabbed by the shoulder and told to listen. And that I need to listen and I need to know exactly what's happening. And if someone breaks off to describe the sky or the weather or something that doesn't need to be there or, or to go upstairs or to have their breakfast, I'm thinking, no, no, get to the point. Because actually, I think all really good writing has a focus to it, a, an energy that draws you straight through. In fact, I, th I always think of it like a thread. It's like you start, if you start with a thread, with a needle and thread at the beginning of a novel, that thread has to stay absolutely taut, unbroken. 
it must never sag or go baggy until the very end when it lets go of you. I don't know if it's the right analogy, but that's how I think of it. And that's what I, I can't write. A, I cannot show anyone anything I've written. I write a lot of bad stuff, obviously, but I don't show anything to anyone until it feels taught in that way. Not even my husband, not anybody, nobody. I never talk about my work in progress. I never show a single sentence of it to anyone. God, I'm not really interested in anyone's opinion either, actually, because, again, I'm my own best editor. I know. And I'm, very, I'm quite tough on myself. I mean, I know I am. Hmm. But I don't, I mean, I don't tend to. That's something, that you're, that's something that your author, that you're the narrator of your novel, shares. I mean, yeah. you're saying a lot of the things that I have written down here that are said in the book. <laughs> yes, I know. They and are all true. I get that, though. I get yeah. not wanting to share. Like, what, what's the point of sharing something that's half-baked yeah. with somebody and asking their opinion on it? It's not going to help. I'm not even slightly interested in what someone else thinks of what I'm writing. Not until it's finished. Then I don't mind. Then I'm delighted to have readers and even even critics because I review books. I'm a critic as well. And I'm absolutely up for being criticised and stuff. But before I've actually produced it, um, I couldn't I, I couldn't care less. I It has to be. It's only me. I'm the only person I'm in the room with. To me, that's the excitement of writing, actually. It's a process that I do entirely alone. I'm entirely in control. It feels quite risky at times. Um, but it, it's so exciting. You realize yeah, well, I do find it very, well, you must find it exciting too. I find it so exciting. It is. And I think that when I'm, when I'm contemplating nonfiction and the reading experience that I had with it, because for folks who have not read it yet, it is what we would refer to as a braided narrative. It works in short chapters or sec short sections uh, within chapters and it really moves which I quite like. And there are different narrative threads that you're weaving together. There's the addiction thread, you know, the mother daughter thread, there's an adultery subplot that you're, uh, that you're writing about. And we kind of, there's a fluidity to the read and the way that it lands on the page that feels related to what you were saying about this process of not knowing and this process of discovery in the act of writing day after day. Yeah, it has that energy to it versus being a novel that was perhaps preconceived and outlined in great detail ahead of time, yeah, which, I've you know, that can that. work. That can, can work. work. But yes. I don't know if you could write a novel like this doing it that way. Like I could no, feel I don't almost think you the, could. Yeah, I could feel like your process of discovery on the page as I was reading or I had some intuitive oh, sense. That's of nice. It. That's very nice. I, I love what you said about fluidity. That's exactly what I want. And I also... And I agree with you, I don't think people do talk enough about actual prose. You know, even in book reviews, people often don't talk about the prose. They talk about the content and, and is the content all right and stuff. And I do think I, I'm very excited by literally the effect. You know, I call them sort of chunks, but, you know, you, you get a chunk in my book about something and then there's a break and then the next bit. For me, I know where things ought to go. And the way I order them is I have to know that the bit that comes next, the next chunk, which might be out of, like you say, out of time, a different different about something different it will have an effect on the bit you've just read and the bit I've just read will also definitely affect the bit that's coming next and when I say effect it will it'll alter the way you read it it will it will have sort of almost color it in a strange way almost literally color it in some ways I'll see it differently I'm very I really see the way the shape of the words and the sentences actually means a lot to me as well I literally visually which I know is a bit crazy because actually most people don't think like that but for me they do and so it will. So I absolutely know it's almost like a. am waiting to see what needs to come after a certain bit. And when you when you put the right thing next, it's a feeling like when you hit a ball in tennis and it's perfect, you know, that where it hits the right. center of the racket, that feeling where you can barely feel it. That's perfect. If you put something next that is trying too hard or a bit lumbering or maybe a bit boring, it doesn't need to be there. I get a funny, jarring feeling about it. And this is the best way I can describe it. It just, maybe it's like music. I mean, I'm not musical, but it feels like hearing the wrong music, totally. Um, and that process is very, it, it's not only very exciting to me, but I, it takes immense concentration, actually, to see and feel those slight differences. I think when I am writing, um, and I get, give myself such back, I have to get up all the time, actually, because I'm in a complete, my whole body gets, goes into sort of, spasm while I'm writing I can't do anything except think so it's, it's very intense concentration but I find it extremely pleasant I love it mm. it's well, almost I mean, like I think a drug that, at times it yeah well and I think what you describe with this tennis analogy I've I've compared it to golf same kind of thing but when you oh, hit a perfect shot like, yeah 
Yeah, but even you know, I'm not a golfer either. But I have hit a golf ball. Like I've yeah. gone to a, the driving range and I've crushed. Like just absolutely, <laughs> it feels great. Yeah. It does. I don't care yes. if you're not a golfer or you're not an athlete. Like when you hit a golf yeah. ball and it sails like 250 yards or meters or whatever, like it's just like yeah. wow. And this is what keeps us coming back as writers. It is like those that feeling that feeling that feeling of connection where it's effortless. Yeah doesn't happen all that often but it happens enough for those of us who are lifers yeah to keep us coming back and to endure all of the more common frustrations that Absolutely. go along with the process you know? <laughs> also I mean as a reader too when I read really good writing it has the same effect on me not it, it literally makes me boil inside it's so wonderful when I read a really good writer who's doing that thing I suppose who's doing the thing that often it's the writer who's doing the thing that I would like to try to do the thing I'm trying to do when they do it and they get it, oh, it's like nothing else. I read very good writing that isn't what I'm trying to do as well. I'm, I'm, in, you know, I like reading writing that I could never write, but I do think it's very exciting to read someone doing what you want to do and they and they're doing it perfectly. I find that very inspiring indeed. It's another yeah, reason too. I write actually. Well, I think like, I think I, I, I'm sure somebody's probably addressed this in an essay or like even a scientific paper, but there was an effortlessness to reading your book and there's an effortlessness that I will experience when I'm reading books that I'm really into, you know, it's that feeling mm -hmm. of just, it's just flying by. Yeah. And I think it's related to the quality of the writing and the, the care and the hundred, 200 times you go over every sentence. Mm. I think some books are just undercooked. They do the writer just hasn't so put agree, that yeah. level of that level of care into it. But like, what is it about that experience of reading? Like what is happening to me psychologically? Because there are books that are well-crafted and admirable. Maybe they're not for me, quote unquote, but it's much slower going. It feels like. I think maybe it's what I look for and it can come in all sorts of shapes. Actually, it isn't always when you expect it. It's that authorial authority. You are, you, you just relax because you know you're in their hands and you know, it's going to be fine, whatever happens. And it might not be something I'm even that interested in, but if, if the writing is like that, I will just go with it. Um, in fact, if, if, if I'm even inclined to, if something does that to me, even if it's slightly flawed, I'll forgive all the flaws because I love it so much. And I feel that about films and, and things too, actually. I, if something convinces me and takes me with it, in fact, I very much feel it about films. If later I read a review that points out a flaw, I'll think, yeah, no, I didn't even notice that. It's probably true, but I don't care. It's a bit like people, actually. When you fall in love with someone, you don't care about the flaws, do you? It's the thing right. that pulls you through. <laughs> and um, there's something else I was going to say. What was it? Oh, I can't remember. Um, no, yes, I do think you're right. I think many books are under-edited, probably by the authors themselves as well as the publishers. But I, it amazes me how many books out there have too many boring bits, you know, literally bits that you skim through, even if you're quite enjoying the book, bits that don't need to be there. And I think what I do really try for in my novels is to not write a single sentence that someone would feel they could skim over, because I don't think you should want to skim over anything in a book. And I just do, In I get impatient and, you know, I do. There are books that I have really liked, but I just know you can, as you're reading, you can tell there's a paragraph you don't necessarily need to take in fully. Well, I hate that. I don't think that should ever be the case. So I'm always trying yeah. to not write a boring sentence, I suppose. Well, yeah. I think you did it in this book, at least from my perspective. <laughs> Thank you. I so en I so enjoyed reading it, and I loved the vitality of it and the way that it felt. Like I always call it. I mean, this is a little bit of a crude turn of phrase, but I always call it. There's blood on the page. <laughs> it felt like you really had something to say in this mm -hmm. novel, and it felt like deeply lived in and human in its concerns. And it's rendered beautifully. So congrats to you. I'm very happy that we got to spotlight it in the book club. And I so always much. end. I Yeah, it's my pleasure. And I always end by asking my guests if they are working on something else. You alluded to it earlier. It sounds like you have a novel in progress. Yeah. Is there anything you can tell us about it? Like just, I know you don't talk about your work, but it, like just <laughs> a hint. <laughs> what could I tell you? It's well, all I can say is it's very different from nonfiction. But when I wrote nonfiction, something changed in my writing. I, I leapt, I took a step somewhere, which has really excited me. And this is still, I'm still there in the place that I took a step to. So in that sense, if people like nonfiction, I think they'll like this book. That's all I can say, though. It's very different. I try, I mean, in my head, all my novels are entirely different from each other. It's only I look back sometimes, I think, no, you're still doing the same thing. You know, we all do have the same story we tell in some ways. And I think I probably am telling the same story, but it feels very different. 
and it feels a bit like a risk in the same way that nonfiction did feel like a risk to write actually. And so, is that the place? It was like the place that you felt like you stepped to in writing nonfiction was a place of, of maybe being more uh, risky on the page or taking more personal risk. Yes, perhaps. I, um, that's a very interesting question. That's one thing. I wonder what the answer to that is. I, I took a step somewhere and was you know, just as hard on myself because I'm always quite hard on myself when I'm writing. I, it didn't fit. I mean, it is more personal, but it wasn't really that. I think <laughs> some of it took me a very long time. The book actually, for quite a short book, took me a very long time to write. And I think I really wrestled with it. And actually, I don't normally wrestle with my books. I think once I, once I know where a novel is going, then I get that exciting feeling we've been talking about and it just goes. This one wasn't like that, actually. I, I doubted this book again and again and again. And, and actually, the reception in the States has been wonderful so far. Um, but it wasn't entirely wonderful here. The people were much more mixed about it. And I think I knew that might happen. So... I wrestled with it. it. It seemed to cost me, perhaps that's it. It seemed to cost me something personally, even though I wasn't sure it was that personal in a way. It both is and isn't personal as we've discussed, but it seemed to, yes, that's, sorry, I finally got there. It seemed to cost yeah. me something that my other books haven't cost me, but it's not the obvious thing. I mean, I know people will listen to that and say, okay, well, what it cost her was she wrote some real stuff, but actually no, it was something different. I had to go somewhere in myself to write it that was slightly uncomfortable. Not therapy, but some, somewhere that felt um, quite painful to be there, I suppose. So no one's ever asked me that question before, so I'm literally saying it and, and working it out as I talk to you. But um, yeah, it cost me something. There is blood on the page. Well, congratulations. Uh, thank you so much for the time and best of luck on this next project, which shall remain mysterious. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>